Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Focus TV Show. I'm your host, Oni Higgins, and we have a fantastic show for you tonight with private investigator Sonia Glover. But first, a quick break. We'll be right back. Beyond Focus TV allows you to discuss contemporary topics affecting the Caribbean people on both the national and local level. The show features informed guests who offer insight, debate, and evaluate various issues. Beyond Focus TV builds on the station's mission to provide useful information to the Caribbean people in New York and abroad. Beyond Focus TV where our viewing audience can get educated, informed, and empowered. Welcome back. You're tuned into Beyond Focus TV show. I'm Oni Higgins, and I'm joined with private investigator Sonia Glover. Thank you for being here tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, talk to us. Tell us what Hard Facts Investigation is for the people at home who have no clue. Hard Facts Investigation is an investigative uh, firm. Uh, it's a business. It consists of myself, private investigator. Um, I do investigatorial work. I um, do uh, background checks, civilian uh, surveillance uh, checks. I do uh, skip tracing, which is I try to locate people. Um, I go out and I do uh, crime scenes. I uh, find witnesses. I interview them. So there's a host of things that I do up under that umbrella. Connected to Hard Facts Investigation, we have an amazing paralegal, and we have now connected to us uh, attorney, Mark Marino, and our power, uh, paralegal is Mark uh, Michael Ocasio. Nice. Uh, private investigation is such a unique field to go into. You often don't hear people say, you know, I want to be a private investigator. So what motivated you to go into this field? Well, I've been in law enforcement now for 33 years. I've had um, a dedication to New York City Police Department for 20 of those years. Um, I love the work that I did there. I love the investigatory work that I did there. I loved working with the community. Um, I had a thing for criminal justice. Um, I have a degree, two degrees in criminal justice. And I said to myself, once I retire, what would I do? So I continue to um, stay in the field and I say, hey, let me try out being a private investigator. And now you got your own, you know, you used to work for somebody yes. else. Now you're doing your own thing. Doing so that's, thing. we always love to see it. So how is it, um, how motivating is it being in a, a industry as vigorous as private investigator? What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? Um, each job is different. Um, just to see how I'm helping, um, helping the community, how I am uh, making a difference, if you will. Um, some cases are a little more vigorous than others, um, depends on the type of case. I get more satisfaction, we work with uh, the wrongfully accused. Those are uh, men and women that have been wrongfully accused, they are incarcerated, um, they're trying to have their story or their case uh, retold to help them uh, come home. Um, those things are very rewarding to me. So cases like that I like. I get cases of um, divorces, um, different cases, process serving. Sometimes those aren't as quite uh, rewarding. Sometimes it's family matters and family matters sometimes never uh, end up well. But we handle those because it needs to. But uh, making a difference of bringing someone home from being incarcerated who has been wrongly accused, um, someone who has done maybe 20, 25 years uh, um, in the prison system uh, to now be uh, released um, is rewarding. It, it, it gives you a sense of uh, justice for the community. So I, I, I really get great pride and pleasure in that. Was criminal justice something that you always knew you wanted to do from young? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, didn't know exactly where I wanted to be. Um, I was always advocating as a teenager, whether it's at school, uh, the debate club, and um, everyone always told me I was good at it. Um, I always uh, needed to find a resolution to something. Um, I always stood on right. And uh, someone would always say, you'll be a great attorney. Um, just 
living in the community um, that I lived in. I lived in New York City House in NYCHA. And just seeing the different uh, wrongs, the injustice, the uh, different disparities, um, it motivated me to speak out, to have a voice. And um, yeah, so I, I knew in some capacity that law would be my thing, would be my bag, yes. Why do you think we need an organization like this here in the community? Well, it helps us try to balance, right? Um, most of us do not have the resources to hire um, a high-profile attorney or to get the legal assistance that we need. Uh, there's a lot of single parents. Um, we have social economics imbalance. So we take some of our cases pro bono. We are out there. We advocate for the community. We are the uh, voices of the people. Um, we advise. Um, we help uh, people with um, legalities, um, things they may not understand. We speak to the young people. We have uh, um, at-risk uh, youth organization as well. And we um, educate them on the things they should and shouldn't do. Um, we tell them a little bit about the law, engage them to um, open a book, read, to arm and protect ourselves against uh, things that can be harmful to us. Sometimes you may think that you um, are saying too much or too less, and sometimes you need to say nothing. It can get you in trouble. So, uh, yeah. I think, um, back to your question, I knew from young, from a teenager, that this would be my field. I think you touched on something important because within our community, as brown people, I think that within legal, within criminal justice, it's a lot that we don't know. It's a lot that we are uneducated about. So having a program where you are educating people, you are giving them those resources, that's important. So how does it feel or what type of impact do you want to leave on the community? Um, that there's, they don't need to feel hopeless, um, that they too can arm themselves. Um, it gives them a sense of hope of not being beat down, taken advantage of. Um, it just gives them a sense of, I don't want to say security, but just to know that someone's there that can help you, that you're not out here and everything is falling down on you, um, that you... Hmm, that you have someone, a group of people that care about you, that um, is not going to take advantage of you, um, that we can't save the world and we're not here to save the world or anything like that, but if we can shed light to help them understand what is happening to them, why is my child being arrested, why is my husband being arrested, if we can explain why, where things went wrong and how it could be fixed, it gives uh, them a little peace of mind and security. And I think those feelings almost fit, hit home a little bit, in a way. Like, within the black and the brown community, was there ever a time you, growing up, you was like, man, I wish I had, like, a legal resource. Man, I wish I knew someone who I could connect a friend with. Um, you know what I mean? So was there ever an experience that you've had? Oh, it's plenty of experiences. Um, I can think of one uh, where my own brother, um, he was arrested and... Um, he was in court, and he was accused of um, grand larceny. And the um, complainant uh, did not know him, um, never saw him before. Uh, my mom hired uh, an attorney. It was an 18B attorney. She worked hard, single mom, and she hired an attorney. And the prosecutor and the attorney was there with the complainant as my brother sat inside the courtroom and they have a petition where they sit and wait to be called to go up to the bench to be heard and uh, the prosecutor, the paid attorney and the complainant would, the complainant was told that is your person and showed him my brother and told him to say that he saw him. I was taken back. And at that at time, I must have been about 16, 17. And I didn't know exactly know what the term was, but I knew it was wrong. 
at that time, I was like, this can't, this can't be, this can't happen. So I approached them, and I joined the circle, and they didn't realize I was there. And I said, is that right that you just did that? And they were taken back. And the attorney said, wait, wait, let me speak to you in the back. But the damage is already done. So, yeah, that was one of the biggest impacts for me was in that moment. Almost life changing a bit, but let me pause you really quick. We're going to head to a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Beyond Focus TV show. I'm Oni Higgins. Picking up where we left off with Sonia Glover. You were just explaining this traumatic experience at 16 year old, 16 years old, seeing your brother uh, go through the court system and just seeing what that can do to you. I don't know if you still have more from that experience that you want to speak about. Um, no, that was basically it. But just um, with your friends, uh, just in the neighborhood that we grew up in and with the brown and black people where we reside you see different things that should not happen um the way that things should be de-escalated it's escalated uh illegal searches things of that nature um really moved me to say you know what you cannot complain if you don't get involved and i felt that i need to be in and do more purpose in then stand on the sideline and do nothing. Yeah, that's what Gandhi said, be the change that you want to yes. see in the world. So that's certainly important. And you having years within the criminal justice um, industry, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions within the industry? So I'm sure there's a whole a whole lot. Um, just one, that the scales are balanced, that justice is equal. I, don't, I, I believe there's two types of justices. Mm. Um, it's not justice for all as it should be it's two justices and I think people get that confused um, you should be in it, innocent to proven guilty brown and black people are guilty too they can prove themselves innocent so I think those are the misconceptions and just explain a little bit more on the two the two um the two, I'm sorry, I'm blinking. Just explain a bit more on the um, two misconceptions that you first mentioned. Wow. Um, just, let's say, uh, Hakeem steals a car. Hakeem will go to jail. Hakeem will maybe do 18 months, three years, where you may have Peter, who steals the same car, same scenario, and he'll get probation or slap on the wrist and release and no jail time. So this, the sanctions are different. I believe the sanctions are different. It's not balanced. It's not even. Um, as to where maybe a drug charge, um, our uh, brown and black people will be charged for, say, marijuana. Well, not marijuana anymore but for a drug sale, and they will get 20 years, where Peter will have the same amount of drugs, and he'll do 18 months. So it's a it's a unbalanced system. And how do you think hard facts investigations balance that? Oh, well, what we do, we go out, we investigate. We go out and we try to figure out what happened exactly to make sure that what is on the report is on the report. What was said to have happened, happened. Uh, to make sure that um, different uh, witnesses weren't coerced. To make sure that they are speaking the truth. That they're telling the story that they want to tell their truth. Sometimes you may have someone influence you to say something different. So we're basically out there just being a second pair of eyes. We're just out there just making sure that things that were said were said. Things that happened should have happened exactly that way. We just reinvestigate. It depends on the case matter. 
And how do you want the community and people who use hard facts investigations, how do you want them to feel, how do you want them to leave after uh, either hiring you or working with you or having you as a resource, how do you want them to leave? Um, just knowing that they had a fair chance, um, that we gave our all. We want them to feel that they're getting the best, um, that they're in good hands. Hmm. And we've seen, you know, I think that the, the murder of George Floyd sparked a lot within our country. Yes, we had Trayvon Martin in the beginning, but George, George Floyd really changed a lot of policy. It changed a lot of uh, sentiments around the world, around the country. So just talk to me on your thoughts on that and how you hope hard facts can impact the community in the same way. Um, well, the policies were great, um, but there's still more work to be done. Um, as we're just speaking, this has just happened again. Um, we're, we're not a crusade. Uh, we're not an organization that is going out there to change the policies. We're here to make sure that what you said happened, happened. We're here to balance in that legal realm. Um, on our own personal time, we advocate and we do things like that, but we're more of an investigatorial organization. Got it, got it. So I know that one notable case that you worked on was the 1995 Jathan Hendrick case, and which led to his exoneration in 2020. Just talk to me on how is it working that case and the impact of it here in the city. Wow. Um, when we received the call to... Um, take on this case, it was a game changer. Um, I spoke and met with Jathan, and I spoke to uh, Thomas Hoffman, the attorney, and when I heard about the case, I was taken back. Um, our job was to find out and go back to the crime scene, rework the crime scene, and to locate all those witnesses that um, testified in this uh, case matter, and we did. Uh, we found out new things. We found out. Um, mm, we found out that there was a lot of co coercion going on. Um, we had people that were willing to speak to us. We had people that, um, after 20 years, really. Um, Remembered, it was an impact, but just reenacting this, uh, the the crime scene was it was it was a lot for me. Uh, we had where we um, had uh, fillings come in and uh, wear the clothing that was allegedly uh, seen. Well, not actual clothing, but the same uh, colors and so forth. We had um, went back to the apartment where. A witness said that they seen it. We were able to take measurements as to what could have been seen. We did it on the actual date and time of year that it happened. Uh, we reenacted that to go and find the witnesses that were children and now are adults, and it had a major impact on them. And to hear their story, it was life changing. It was life changing. Sonia, I'm going to pause you really quick. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm sitting here with private investigator Sonia Glover. And I think once we went on commercial break, we were talking about something very important. And it was that Jathan 1995 case. So let's pick up where we left off. And you were explaining the rigorous detailing that you went back to and a lot of the uh, court proceedings. Just talk to me on what type of um, impact do cases like this have on the community? 
Oh, on the community and on the families, um, just bringing the families back together. Most of the times when you re reenact and you knock on the door and you ask someone, uh, do they remember? It drugs up bad feelings, um, uncomfortable feelings. Most people are not welcoming. It uh, brings up bad memories for many. Um, whether, doesn't matter what side you're on, whether you're the victim or the person is the defendant, it's still drugged up, you know, bad memories, and that's what we did. You stir the pot, um, not intentionally, but you need to get the information. And sometimes you may lead someone open, you know, and how do you close that? But sometimes they're left open because you need to get the facts, you need to get the information to help exonerate someone. So I find that a lot of times to be heartbreaking. You know, um, sometimes you may have a uh, victim's mom just cry. It's like just pulling off a scab. But sometimes you have to do that to get to the bottom, to get to where you need to go, to get the answers that was not asked, or to fix what was broken. So sometimes it's not a good feeling. It, it's not good at all. Definitely. I always say people who work in criminal justice, law, health, medical field, it, it can be traumatic news. It can be traumatic seeing trauma literally every single day. Has there ever been a case or a time in your career history where, you know, it was like, you know what, this is too much. This case is too much or this incident I'm working is just too much for me. Um, crimes the, uh, with children could be a lot. Um, it has been a time, um, I wasn't as seasoned at one point, and I was the, one of the first members to a scene, and it was a gunshot victim, and he had a gunshot wound to the head, something I was not used to, unfamiliar, and it took me a few, a few months to really get over that. It was a lot. It was traumatic, and to see the mom and the family members crying, it was very, it was traumatic for me. I, I took a few days off. I had to take off. It was something that I wasn't used to. Um, and how do you uh, not feel the pain of another human that has just taken a loss? It, it's hard. It's traumatic. So, yes, yeah, sometimes you can get swallowed up inside of what's going on. And you have to take a, a step back and regroup to move forward. But it can be taxing. And certainly for those who don't even work in criminal justice or medical field legal, we're seeing unarmed black men, you know, get shot on the Internet now. We're seeing people dying on the Internet. So you almost become a little bit desensitized to That's it a bit just seeing it. It becomes normal, right? It's a normalcy. And, and, and we're, in bad, we're in bad shape. Because now, when we do see these things on the TikTok or Instagram, it's like, oh, here we go again. And then you have people probably make a meme about it. We're in a bad state, but these things are real. Um, the other people on the other side of the spectrum, they're really hurting. And, and no matter how we block it out or say it's try to normalize it, 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 it can never be normalized to me. Each case I take... Um, not personally, I take it individually is what I want to say. And I walk into it with a different eyesight each time. But sometimes it's hard and I don't want it to become normal to me. So I come each time differently because each case is different. How do you just de-stress, debrief after having, after having a vigorous or a tough case? Meditation. Um, I come home to quiet. And just meditate, stay in prayer, and that's it. It works. And what advice would you give to young people, young professionals who want to get into private investigation, who wants to get into criminal justice? Follow your dreams. You will have uh, people that discourage you. Um, you're not going to always get it right, but keep trying. Um, integrity is everything. Do not ever waver, stay on course, and be honest. Be honest and follow your dreams. 
And when you say be honest, be honest with who? Um, be honest with the clients. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with, uh, you'll have people trying to persuade you to look, look the blind eye. You may have someone try to get you to taint something. Your integrity, your word is everything. Honesty. You have to stay focused. Well, I think that all of those jewels that you just gave us are certainly important for young people who are out there that want to get into criminal justice, that want to get into private investigation. Make sure that you're at home taking notes because Sonia just gave you the keys to life right there. Keys to the criminal justice private investigation uh, field. If you want to get in contact with Sonia, make sure that you stay up to date and get her contact information, which is at the bottom of our screen. And everyone who is watching at home, thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a powerful conversation and make sure that you tuned in to Beyond Focus TV show every week. I'm your host, Oni Higgins. Have a good night. Beyond Focus TV show wants and needs your feedback. Did we blunder? Please let us know so we can improve. Was the show helpful to you? Drop us a note so we can share the success with our staff members. Is there something you think we could do better? We welcome new ideas and new approaches to old ideas. Do you have a great suggestion? Let us know, and we'll work on it. If you would like to share your comments anonymously, please send us an email at info at beyondfocusmedia.com. If you want to get in touch with the executive producer directly, send him an email at gene at beyondfocusmedia.com. We really look forward to hearing from you.